I'm very pleased to be able to announce to you um, this week's Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series speaker, uh, Adam Grosser. Adam, um, for 10 years now, for, since 2000, uh, has been a general partner at Foundation Capital. Um, uh, he's been, prior to that, uh, the president of Excite at home. Um, he's worked at um, uh, um, really um, some of the most famous firms in, uh, um, in technology and in entertainment, including uh, Apple, Lucas Films, and Sony. Um, and he's on approximately eight different um, boards. It may be more now, I'm not sure, but at least eight that we know of. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm extremely happy to be able to present him here for you for, the, uh, for this speaker series. Thanks. Hi. So this, this talk is uh, a, a bit of a gamble on my part. I, uh, when Iklok asked me and Burghardt asked me to come and, and say a few words, I, I decided to try and synthesize 30 years of work experience in the Valley into uh, a 40 minute talk that's a, that's a bit of a ramble. Um, and so the way I, I like to think about this is there was a, a famous 1950s politician named Adlai Stevenson and he used to begin all of his uh, uh, campaign speeches with the following quote. He used to say, my job is to speak and yours is to listen. And I can only hope that we both begin and end at the same time. And uh, I, I believe that concern still holds true. And, and so I'm going to try and, and be cogent. But this is a bit of a ramble. And, and there are definitely uh, some, some different topics. So, my plan this afternoon is to talk to you about some macro themes in, in investing and in entrepreneurship, a few thoughts about venture capital broadly, some opinions on the clean tech sector where I've spent a, a fair amount of time for the last nine years, and, and then hopefully leave you with a, a framework to consider as you contemplate starting a company or going out in the world. So this is a bit of my personal philosophy. And the way I, I, I look at this uh, is that I've come to believe that what we do as entrepreneurs and, and in venture capitalists is, is to push back a, a little bit on the inexorable forces of the universe. And, and I really like to think of it that what we do is a, a whole lot of really small events that add up to something that can momentarily change the tides. And, and I think it's required because what I've observed after working in Silicon Valley for the past 28 years is that it's so much easier to tear down, to say no, to be an obstruction, to fight than it is to imagine or to build or to negotiate or to say what if. And I was at a lecture a couple of weeks ago um, by the chess player and strategist Gary Kasparov. And he made a really interesting observation where he said that optimization limits evolution. And I, I couldn't agree more. And what we find ourselves, when we get into a comfort zone, we tend to bring in the bounds of what's reasonable or what's what we think is possible. And so we end up operating in a very limited solution space where we just move a few things around in a little box. What we really need to do, if you're going to do anything meaningful, is blow it up and, and move over here. And I think nowhere is this more evident than in the role of startups and, and entrepreneurs. And so I, I, want to, I, want to, I want you to think about this a little bit differently. I want you to think about Collectively, we all operate at the nexus of a set of extraordinarily special circumstances. And it's, it's a place where intellect is celebrated and failure is embraced and race and religion are by and large ignored and the status quo is old news. And it's a fragile place, uh, to be sure. It's difficult to recreate and it's easy to destroy. But there's a couple of really notable historical parallels, and it's worth thinking about. Um, Athens, at the height of the classical period, around 450 BC. Um, Florence, under the Medicis, around 1450. 
and Paris in the 1920s. And interestingly, all three of those places were about 25 square miles. And each of them attracted the best and the brightest to come and exchange ideas. In each case, the resulting creative product had an outsized impact on cultural norms, and societal boundaries were advanced very quickly in short periods of time. And you can see this same phenomenon in, in our own entrepreneurial enclaves today, like, like Silicon Valley. So here's what I'm worried about in, in the largest perspective. Uh, I'm worried that our country is atrophying, rusting, to, to, to put uh, a, a fairly fine point on it. You know, we consume too much, we produce too little, and, and outside of institutions such as yours, we've really largely forgotten what it means to be intellectually hungry. Similarly, and importantly, the US hegemony on innovation, which we've mostly taken for granted for the past 50 years, is over. China and India are industrializing at a record pace, and both their leaders and populations recognize that education and technological sophistication are the fastest path to economic expansion. So somewhat simplistically, there are three things that are broken in the United States today. And the first is education. I'm going to tell you two things that you're just simply not going to believe because uh, how hard you work and how intelligent the people in this room are. But if you look at the most recent census data, the percentage of Americans age 25 that, a bachelor's, that, that hold a bachelor's degree has declined to 15.5% nationally. And that's, that's a travesty. It, it, it's, it's impossible to believe that when you look around in this room. And that, but the, the challenge is this room is comprised entirely of a group of outliers. Even more disappointing was the recent Joint Chiefs of Staff report on readiness. And I'm going to read the quote here. 75% of young, young Americans are, are unable to serve their country because they have either failed to graduate high school, engaged in criminal activity, or are physically o too obese or mentally incapable of passing the entrance exam, unquote. So while meaning no disrespect to our armed forces, I didn't realize this was the high watermark for national achievement that we were all striving for. My contention is that if we stay on the current trajectory, the only thing we're going to have a population good for is watching reality TV. The, the, the second real challenge, and it's one to think about, and if you look around this room, it's, it's a case in point, is immigration. We educate the very best and brightest from all over the world in, in our economic and in our educational institutions, and then make it impossible for people to stay here. It's completely brain dead. So if you look at the university system in the United States, we matriculate 16,000 graduate students in engineering and the sciences every year. Last year, China graduated 110,000 PhDs in engineering and science. Half of the 16,000 people that are in the US are foreign nationals. As one of my very good friends, Ashmeet Sadana, so eloquently remarked one day at, over lunch, he said, you know what, we should just stamp a visa on every student's forehead and beg them to stay. Uh, it, it is a travesty of, of a perversion of the system as it stands today. So the third problem is, is a little more subtle, but, but no less insidious. And that's our obsession with short-termism. You, you cannot you categorically cannot provide any kind of solutions to systemic problems like climate change or healthcare or hunger by focusing on short-term goals. And yet, everything about the country is geared, it's endemic to our regulatory framework, to our election cycles, uh, to financial reporting. So we're constantly selling out our future for some really uh, fairly trivial uh, short-term reporting cycles that, that, that we're, we're trying to make something look palatable in the near term. So f for me personally, growing up, one huge catalyst was the space race. And you know, I, what, so I take those three things, education and immigration and uh, sh short-term focus, and, I, and I've, you sort of coalesce that to what I call the aspiration gap. And I think that we don't have a national agenda or a national imperative that you can galvanize a large segment of the population to, to, to actually go out and work hard around. And so for me, 
I was captivated by the space race. I was born, I was born in 1961. And so the entire decade I was growing up was all about getting to the moon. And, and here's something that people, most people don't realize. On the, on the date of the first moon landing in 1969, the average age of the engineers in mission control was 26. So that means when President Kennedy gave his speech exhorting the country to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade, th those engineers were 18. They were just starting out. They were just thinking about what they were going to do with their lives. And th that's important. We, we need a national agenda. So I'd like to back up for a, a moment and tell you a little bit about me. And then I'm going to back up even farther in, into the 1800s and talk about how I got here and why I think it relates to this talk. Um, so I, I, I've always made things. And, and this is, it, it's never really mattered to me whether it was hardware or software or food or furniture or companies. Um, there's, there's a lot of things I'm not very good at. But I was, for whatever reason, born knowing how things should go together. And I studied, I studied uh, engineering and art, and then graduate work at a school down the road. And I, I spent the first 11 years of my career at Apple designing computers. Um, and then I went back to business school. And then I went to Lucasfilm. And I ran Industrial Light and Magic for a number of years and made a lot of movies that you've probably seen and then was president of Sony when they bought Columbia and TriStar. And then I did started three companies that went ridiculously uh, well, and I was incredibly lucky. Um, <laughs> so I, I've been really fortunate. And entrepreneurship has taught me the best lessons of my life, the lessons in failure, and lessons, in, lessons in success, lessons in humility. Uh, and uh, so I, I now that I start companies, I had to get some outlet for my personal projects. So I started building things at home. And I, I took over the garage. And that didn't go so well. So my wife sort of kicked my project out. Because as, as I've gotten older, my projects get larger and heavier. So I've got a couple of pictures of things I've made over the past 10 years. Um, and I'll go through those quickly. So that's a, a Mackenzie River drift boat. It's about 18 feet long. Then I got fascinated by Damascus steel and making better cooking knives the way Japanese people do. So I bought a forge and started making steel. Um, and then I thought maybe, well, I should build an airplane. That sounds hard. So uh, um, there's this really great guy named Curtis Pitts, and he made biplanes. And uh, uh, this was the last plane he designed before he, he, he died uh, a few years ago called a, a Pitts Model 12. That's what it looked like when I finished it. Um, so I got stuck in the airplane rut. Um, and I went and I to a boneyard out in the desert. And I bought the pieces of a 1951 Lockheed T-33. And three years later, I had that put together um, and, and flying. But it turns out that planes designed in 1951 don't have any redundancy. So I got kind of nervous after flying it for a while. So I went over to the Ukraine and found um, a plane that had been sitting outside for 13 years and was missing a lot of pieces. But I brought it home and worked on that for three years. And, um, that, that's me taking off to go to the Oshkosh Air Show this past July. Then, then I got interested in um, the efficiency side of things, because I spend a lot of time working on energy efficiency. And going back to boats, I decided that I would build a hydrofoil, since there aren't any hydrofoils in the US. And this is last week. We were putting the boat. I've been building this for about three years. Uh, this is in the San, putting it in the bay for the first time to see if it actually leaked. Um, fortunately, it didn't leak, and it managed to float approximately where we thought it would. But since hydrofoils are about 60% more efficient when they're up than a displacement hull, it, it seemed like something worth, worth doing. Um, so that's what I do when I'm not working. Um, but I, I, I'd like to go back even farther and tell you a little bit about sort of why I think I'm wired the way I am, and, and then I'll come back to venture capital and entrepreneurship. But I'd like to tell you about my great-grandfather. Um, as I was struck by how incredibly differently he thought about time frames and the importance of education and, of course, immigration, um, the same themes that I think are, are really plaguing us now. So that's my great-grandfather, uh, Elkon Grocer, with his wife, Jenny. Originally, he had a different last name that had a lot of consonants, and I can't possibly hope to pronounce it. 
but thankfully they got lost somewhere along the way. This picture's from about 1915. My grandfather is the person who looks like a girl in the white dress sitting on his lap. Um, uh, so Elkhorn was born in 1870 in a part of Russia that's now the Ukraine. And so think about this, 1870, no electricity, subsistence farming, really, really cold most of the time, a lot of hard work. And to make matters worse, that he was taken from his farm in 1883 and conscripted into the Tsar's army where he was moved to Siberia. So you think about this, you're 13 years old, you're ripped out of your house, you're, you're put in the army, and you're taken somewhere even colder. Um, and so in 1890, he was 20, and he'd been in the army for seven years. He was injured in a battle. And, and as he told me, in a moment of clarity, he decided that his life expectancy would be pretty short if he kept this up. So he deserted. And this is the part that I still can't get my head around all the time. He, he said, I'm going to walk across Russia. And I have, you know, so he's on the run from the army. He has no money. He doesn't know anybody. And so for two years, he walks across Russia until he gets ultimately to Germany. And he pays his way because he grew up on the farm and he was always mechanically inclined. And he traded his repair skills on farms for room and board. And in Germany, he got, when he got there, he, he met a machinist. And the machinist took him in as an apprentice. And he also met and married my great-grandmother, Jenny, who was at the time 16. And in 1895, when he was, he was 25, he said, you know, let's go to America. And they couldn't afford to both go to America. So he said, I'm going to go to America, and I will, I, I will make a lot of money, and I'll, I'll, I'll send for you. And so she, here's this woman, and you know, she's 20 now, and they have, a, they have their first child. And, and she's got to believe that he's going to have, take the long view, and he's going to be successful. And so he saved, they saved their money, and he manages to buy the cheapest steerage ticket on this, which, and, and this, this ship was the USS Penland. And he had a steerage ticket way below, below the waterline. And, and they had to get through this really miserable uh, three-week crossing of the Atlantic. And he shows up on Ellis Island, and he only speaks Russian and German, not a word of English. That's where his, all the consonants got ripped out of his name. And here's the amazing part. They figured out that he was competent. They figured out that he was a natural engineer. They figured out that he'd been an apprentice to a machinist. And in three weeks, he was employed at the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia as a boiler maker. And you have to take yourself back. Because you go, oh yeah, OK, locomotive trains. That's not very interesting. It was, because Baldwin made the best locomotives on the planet. And it was the height of the railroad boom in the United States. So it, you really have to think that Baldwin was to the population as Google is to you guys. It, it was important. It was seminal. It was changing the world because it enabled communication and commerce and a, an exchange of information at a pace that, that had, had, had not been seen before. And so Alcon worked there as a master machinist until 1930 when he opened his own business. And along the way, he did, in fact, bring his wife over and her family and his two brothers. And he raised six children, all of whom went to college. And, but most remarkably, and really out of his control in a large part, he lived to be 104. And he died peacefully in 1974. And Elkhorn was amazing in that his, his mental acuity never faded. And I got to know him. I mean, I, he died when I was 14. So we spent a lot of time talking. And we used to talk about the breadth of things that he'd seen and experienced in his long life. And you have to think about this. This lifespan subsistence farming in a, in a pit in Russia to watching the man on the moon with his great grandson. And that was, that's a stunning, that's a stunning legacy. And, and you know, I always think about the Arthur C. Clarke quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, and so many of the things that Elkhorn experienced and used, like a microwave oven, you know, at the, at the end of his life would have been magical at the beginning of his life. 
And it was, a, it was an amazing century to witness. And, and you know, from where I sit, he had it figured out. He knew that knowledge was power. He knew that planning with a 20-year time horizon, he'd find a way to keep the promises to the family. And he knew that eventually a poor Russian immigrant would fit into American society. And he was aspirational, and he wanted to be at the center of change. And, and I think that's, there's a really powerful lesson there. And so I believe that if the American problem broadly writ is complacency, you guys are the solution. And I think your energy and your passion and your drive and your commitment are, are what's going to pull this country back from uh, a, a, a possible decline into the outdoor cafe syndrome. So I'm going to shift gears for a bit. I, I, I am fundamentally an optimist. And, and there's no way to be a venture capitalist if you're not optimistic. But, but you know, I, I categorically believe that entrepreneurship and innovation really can be the template to inspire the next generation of American workers. Because it really is ours to dream up. Everything is invented. They're all constructs of ours. And it's ours to incubate. It's not easy, but it's available to you. You have the brains. You have the, the, the capital resources. You have the support of the community. And you know it, it, it's, it's your turn. And it's ours to create together. I mean, if you're an engineer, go find a business person. And if you're a business student, go find an engineer and start the dialogue. It's important because this is what's made us great for the last hundred years. You know, worst case, if you do, if you go out and <laughs> invent something wonderful, we're not going to decline as quickly. Best case, we hold our own on the global stage as an intellectual force to be reckoned with. Um, it, you know, it, it, it is the American dream. It is the American message. So, it clock suggest that I talk a little bit about the, the venture capital environment and, and company formation. So a couple things to think about. First and foremost, you know, venture capital is non-deterministic. You know, great companies fail. Exogenous factor create all kinds of unstable dynamics. And ascribed value can be incredibly and frustratingly subjective. Timing and luck play an enormous role. And a skilled practitioner must continually adapt to market conditions. You know, it, it's not a place for the faint of heart. And the most important advice that I can give you is to get real experience in the kinds of companies you're interested in starting. Because to be relevant, you need to have succeeded and failed. You need to learn the lessons. And you need to be able to offer tangible advice to the leaders of your companies. A talented CEO is just not going to gel well with an opinionated but inexperienced investor or founder. So this is an idealized view of what it takes to start a, a, a company. And if you look at the left, where it says 3,000 projects, we, we see about 3,000 new ideas every year. And we don't accept generally business plans that come over the transom. We have to know somebody, or we have had, we're, we're often ex primarily an outbound focused organization. So we, we fund somewhere between 10 and 12 companies a year. And so you think about that, and you say, we're saying yes a half a percent of the time, or, or flipped around the other way, we're saying no 99 and a half percent of the time. And that's as it should be, because in 10 and a half years of doing this in roughly 30,000 companies, there are very, very few false negatives. There are only, I can think of three companies that I wish we'd said yes to out of tens of thousands of, of, of things that we've looked at. So what you bring needs to be great. So the other thing to think about on this, on this chart is as you think about 
developing products and building your team and ramping revenues and, and doing all the things it takes to be a company. Right now, to, make, to bring a company to maturity takes about eight years. And that's a big slug of time. It's a big slug of your life. So it, it, it helps to um, make sure that you're doing something that that's, that's really worthwhile and that's meaningful. So to put it in perspective, everybody wishes they'd funded Facebook. But no one talks about the 601 venture capital-backed social networking startups that didn't achieve greatness. So this is a page of just the A's where we cataloged all 601 VC-backed companies. When I said things are non-deterministic, great story. YouTube. There were 87 uh, venture-backed video aggregation sites. YouTube was one of the pack. It was indistinguishable. It was not particularly noteworthy on any dimension that you would care about. It wasn't technologically differentiated. It didn't have a business model. Somebody posted a piece of content. It happened to be a Saturday Night Live episode on YouTube. Many people came and watched. Many people never left. That's why YouTube was successful and Grouper wasn't. That's very hard to predict. So it, 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 the category and class, sort of the genus and species, if you will, of the kind of startup that you predict or that you, that you uh, germinate makes a huge difference in, in what your life might be like. So th this is a uh, chart that really defines what venture capital can be. Um, as much fun as it is to dream the future, venture capital is somewhat constrained by this chart. And it defines the boundaries of what's possible to undertake as a venture capital investment. So we're in the business of one thing. And it's not changing the world, and it's not starting companies, and it's not working with great entrepreneurs. Those are the ancillary benefits that make it fun. What we're in the business of doing is returning money to the people who invest in us. So they are interested in a risk-adjusted rate of return that's better than they can get with other pools of money. So take, for example, the red line on this chart, which is the 36% IRR chart. And if you look at the elapsed time, and you go over to about eight years, which is what things take to get to maturity now, and you go up to the payback ratio, it looks at about 12, you have, you've, got to get, you've got to return 12x on your money. That isn't 12x on the first round. That isn't 12x on the second round. That's 12x on every dollar you've put in a project. And I will tell you, speaking from a platform of, uh, uh, where, where we've had in a, a, a lot of success in a difficult decade, that's almost impossible. So you either have to figure out how to shorten the time horizon, or have an enormous success. And, and, and that constrains where you can be, for example, on the research versus development curve uh, in the startup. You can't have a lot of science projects. As much fun as it is to dream about the future, venture capital you know, really hinges around a, a robust IPO market. And again, what this chart shows is that there have been huge structural shifts in, in the past 10 years. And IPOs are down dramatically. Um, 2009, this data goes to 2008, but 2009 isn't fundamentally very different. And 2010 is flat to 2009. And the, required, the, the requirements to access the public markets are incredibly stringent right now. To be considered viable for, as an IPO candidate, you need to be at about $100 million in revenue. You need to have been, had many successive profitable quarters. You need to have growth rate that's outsized. And uh, that means that companies stay private longer. And that means that they need more support for their, from their institutional investors. It also means that the average market cap has skyrocketed. So the average market cap of, of an IPO today is, is well over a billion dollars. And to put that in perspective, Cisco went public uh, at, at, with a market cap of $225 million and, and then grew into something that's worth you know, $70 or $80, $90 billion today. The second real structural shift is that the lack of a robust IPO market 
has made the predominant form of exit an M&A transaction. And you can see the dark blue bars growing over time over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. But the challenge is without a healthy, incredible IPO market to offer a real alternative, that there's very little price support. And the earnings multiples have declined significantly from historical levels. And so this led, leads to basically a lot of bottom fishing. And when I said that company values are very subjective, you know, a company that 10 years ago might have been worth 150 or $200 million, that company is worth 10 today. Um, and, and so there's a lot, of ch a lot of changes. It's also interesting to note that a lot of the M&A is concentrated by a short list of global giants. And this, true, this, this has created this weird symbiosis where VC-backed companies have essentially become outsourced R&D or off-balance sheet financed technology development. Um, and we've really lost a lot of the promise of creating great standalone companies that are able to persist for decades. Um, you know, this data is also a couple years old, but the trend has continued. If you just look at this year at like three par and data domain, uh, it's, it follows the, the, very consistently. The, the other real challenge for, for, for us as an industry is that there's too much money in the asset class. And that there's so much money from large pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and people looking for alpha that it's flooded the market and it's thrown the industry out of balance. And if you look at the top right of the chart, if you look at the difference between that VC deployed $5 billion in 96 and, and 12 and a half in 2006, and you look that the median investment size has doubled, yet the, the number of quality exits is down significantly. That, that's not sustainable. Um, you know, and, and, and when I talk about the size of some of the sovereign wealth funds, there are a number of, of Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds that are all over the valley right now um, with $600 billion to, uh, each to deploy. And all of them want to put 10% into various forms of private equity. And so it's relatively straightforward if you're halfway decent at this business to raise a fund. And that has created a really weird dynamic because most of the weaker VCs should disappear. It, it, you know, there's a lot of data that suggests that unlike any other asset class, venture capital, there's a lot of persistence. So the good projects and the good people go to the top 20 firms for, for decades on end. And it, it's very different than any other form of invested capital, like a hedge fund, where it, it, there's a, a tremendous amount of churn because there's a lot more uh, luck or serendipity uh, or guessing uh, in, in making a, a particular year better than another. So how do you think about this stuff? I mean, this is one of those things where you have to kind of get your head around a, a model. And so this is something that, that I put together, and it helps me. I don't know if it'll help uh, other people. But this is when, we, when we, nine years ago when I started to think about investing in clean tech. I had to, to, to come up with some ontology, if you will, to map the world. And so each practice area is different. But so if you look at this, there's just a number of axes that allow you to think about a project in a way that's substantively uh, meaningful. And the, the most important thing is it allows you to make sure that an investment maps very well to whatever your stated investment philosophy at a given point in time is. Um, and, and I believe that people are much likely to be better investors if they're explicit about their choices. So the next few slides are really reflections on my learnings from 10 years of being an investor. And as a technologist, some of these truths are really difficult for me to swallow. I wanted the most beautiful solution to win, but, but often it doesn't. And a great project in a small market just has too much friction. And a weak team can take the best idea and pound it firmly into the ground. So if you are all thinking about starting something, you, the, the first piece of advice would be to relentlessly filter on market size. And the second thing is the people you work with have to be the very best people on the planet that you can find in the field that you're working in. The, 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 the second thought is really that 
it's so easy to get swept up in the momentum of something. I remember being a sophomore in college and uh, going to work over the summer at a company that was going to make this, this, new, this new kind of display, a liquid crystal display. And I came home and I told my parents, I'm going to drop out. And, and they said, like hell. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it was a less understanding time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and thankfully, I didn't because the company was bankrupt in, in a few months. But remember, the average project takes a long time to mature. It's a huge time commitment, and you need to optimize for success. Y y this is a time to be bloodless in, in your evaluation, assuming your goals are financial. If you're, if you're on the philanthropic or on the social engineering side, you, you have a totally different agenda. But if your goal is to make money, you know, since VCs fund so, so little of what we actually see, you need to be equally rigorous in, in your, with your time if you want to be one of the 10 companies that actually thrive each year. And just, just by way of a proof point, I, I went back this summer to the National Venture Capital Association's database in Washington. And then I went over to New York and, and met with most of the big investment banks and did a lot of research in the last 20 years. There's 10 companies that matter every year. There's not hundreds, there's not thousands, and there's probably two a decade that become household names. So you really need to be incredibly intellectually honest about the idea um, and, and what, you, what you're doing. So for me, this slide says it all. It, it's probably a thousand to one features to companies. You, 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 know, you can all relate to the, I wish my phone did the, you know, that's a feature. Or I saw this great new self-loading clothesline, that's a product. But so rarely do you hear we've come up with a wide area network optimization schema based on genetic algorithms, and we think there's a whole family of products that'll address the needs of the global 2000. That's a company. That's when you get excited. That's when you say, OK, they're on to something that, that, that matters. Um, features and products aren't viable for venture capital investment. You, you really have to find the very few, the, 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 the companies that, that come with all the rest. So I, I'm not much on reading words on slides. I, I, I always get upset when people come up and read every bullet point to me um, as, as though I can't read. But, but this is important. Um, unless you're operating an ad-supported business or you're, pu you're purely a, a consumer internet company, you need to be able to answer this question. I, you know, I can't tell you how often I see people who, who've never considered the aspect of their, co of their prospective company. And you know, if you just ask yourself, how will I sell this product? To whom? For how much? You, you, and you have defensible answers. You, you're, you're way ahead of most startups, and you're actually on the way to doing something interesting. Um, People don't realize how expensive it is to build a sales channel. A sales channel can cost you $50 million. You know, different, different constituencies, different customer bases have enormously different rhythms. The enterprise is, by and large, a layup. Everybody understands how to sell to them. It's, it's $12 billion of consumption just in IT alone. It grows 6% a year. Government is an enormous market. It's brutally hard for a startup to get into it. Consumers are fickle. So you need to think about this. You need to be thinking about how fast can I grow? Can I have a 60% gross margin? What does the distribution look like? Because that's what's going to make you viable. That's what's going to give you a different earnings multiple. And that's what's going to make you attractive financially. So if you're coming to see someone like me, there's a few things you should understand. Most venture capitalists are overcommitted. They're easily bored. And unfortunately, they're often rude. And they will sit and, when they get a little bored or distracted, look at their phones. So you need to do something that cuts through the noise. And, and I think being charismatic is the first step. The second step is having a very succinct presentation. Because your goal on the first meeting of meeting a venture capitalist is not to do anything else but get them interested in enough to have a second meeting. Because at the second meeting, they will ask cogent questions. They will bring in young associates who have domain expertise. And they will start a process to make your idea 
a potentially fundable company. So here's what I would suggest. Hit the high notes. Cover your mission. Define the problem. Explain why your solution is the, is, is the second coming. Talk about the enormity of the market size. Why your technology or your business process is truly differentiated and defensible. Understand the competition. Explain why the quality of your team matters and who, who you've got on your side. And have credible financial projections. I can't tell you how many companies I see where the slide says year one, zero, year two, five million, year three, 150 million. That doesn't happen, period, end of story. Uh, the only companies that grow like that are semiconductor companies, and that's in year seven, eight, and nine. So you're trying to impart a patina of goodness such that you can broaden the conversation to other people in the firm. So I thought I'd talk for a moment about clean tech and, and green investing, because it is topical. And, and, and you know, I thought it was appropriate since we were in Berkeley. I started Foundation's clean tech practice nine years ago. And at that time, it was pretty unique. There were very few firms investing in the space. And it turns out that the approach that we took was both contrarian, enormously successful, lucky, um, and it wasn't, wasn't copied for a, a, long, a long time. So I've always loved this quote. And I think it's particularly true when, when, when contemplating solutions to climate change. It, it's, uh, I think it's very relevant. So zooming way out, the world consumes about 18 terawatts of energy every year. And that number is projected to grow to, pick, pick your guess, somewhere between 28 and 35 terawatts by the year 2035. Not that far away. We need more of it. Um, it's, not, it's distributed approximately like you'd imagine it would be. Um, the, the sources are also, there, there are no surprises. Um, it's somewhat depressing, but there are no surprises. The thing to note, really, is that non-renewable resources, gas, coal, and oil, dominate the playing field. And renewables barely show up. So this is a bit of an eye chart. And this is the world energy flows in quadrillions of BTUs. And there's a couple things that are worth noting here. Again, if you see nuclear, coal, natural gas, and oil, they, they are the predominant sources. If you look at the, the you know, solar and wind and, and the thickness of the lines as they traverse this, they are, they are ridiculously small. The, the second thing to note is if you're looking for large markets and, and you, you want to be in places where energy is aggregated, so electricity generation is about a third res, uh, of, of the, the source energy. It's a great place to concentrate and one of the places we did. Similarly, the industrial markets are, are coalesced into broad groups that you can address and sell to efficiently. The third thing to note, and this is what really shaped our practice, is that rejected energy, most often in the form of waste heat, is almost equivalent to useful work done by energy at the, far, the, the other end. So more than a third of the source energy just goes up in heat. Venture capitalists are, are nothing if they're not sheep-like. And as this ramped up, venture capitalists started pouring money into clean tech at the rate of about $4 billion a year, um, most of them in, in Silicon Valley. But with stunning uh, bad aim, 75% of the dollars is concentrated in three areas. Uh, supply side generation, cars, and batteries. And these are all sort of fundamentally important areas, but they have one, one common distinction that, that makes them unattractive as an investment, and that's their commodity. They're fundamentally commodities. And commodity markets care about a single variable, which is cost. We chose to play in the other 25%, which you, you, turns out you can differentiate m much more easily. When I said the VC folks tend to jump into things quickly, you can see the ramp, the very quick ramp from zero to a couple hundred to 
a, a relatively steady state of about 350 green investments a year across the industry. That fits because on average, there's about 1,200 new companies funded by venture capitalists every year. So it's not, it's not that many. So this is about a third of it. So you kind of look at IT, life sciences, and, and clean tech as, as the three broad areas. And, and under IT, I'm lumping consumer and infrastructure and, and datacom, telecom as well. So, so our view of this landscape is a little bit different. We looked at thousands of companies, and what we decided was that efficiency is the, it was a better way to go. And the metaphor we used for it was there's this bucket. And the bucket has a lot of holes in it. And we could either pour a lot more energy in the top of the bucket, i.e. supply side investing, or we could fix the holes in the bucket. And the reason we decided to fix the holes in the bucket was twofold. One was we didn't need regulatory reform to uh, make the businesses economically viable. The second thing was that that, that the business models worked without subsidies. And really, a third order effect was that if you make something more efficient, you don't change, you don't rip it out if the underlying commodity it, uh, price fluctuates. So you, if you put in a more efficient water heater, you don't take it out if the price of oil or, oil goes, or gas goes up or down. So all of our leaders have become, lead, uh, all of our companies have become market leaders. And here's how the investments map. And when I took, go back to that, that, that diagram earlier, the ontology, you know, this is, this is what we chose to do, a relatively small number of companies. We've made 12 investments in, in nine years. You know, some companies make 12, some VC firms make 12 investments a quarter. Um, we, we chose to play on the capital efficient side. We chose to play on the demand side as opposed to the supply side. We, we invested in local companies and we invested in places where we could be on the board and hopefully make a difference. And this is, I, I took the, the opportunity to take a look at uh, another prominent venture capital firm's clean tech investments. And this is not to say it's right or wrong. It's a different philosophy. But Vinod Kozla, a smart guy, probably has spoken here. He's a very eloquent and thoughtful person. But he said, you know what? I, I'm going to be, I, I don't want to be on the board. I don't want to be active. I'm going to make hundreds of investments in lots of companies, and, and natural selection will, will filter for me. I'm not going to filter towards something that's immediately deployable. I'm going to filter on science projects. And, and I'm going to look at things that have broad applicability around the world. It's a really different philosophy. So if you just look back at you know, the shape of ours versus theirs, you know, it's a different model. And uh, we, I will tell you that we've been more successful financially in the short term. But I, I think Vinod is a very smart person, and, and this may uh, turn out to be very viable in, in the longer term. So here's a quick case study on the electricity grid, because this is where we've spent a, a ton of time and, and made uh, some great investments. The grid before 2006 was completely antiquated. There's, there really isn't a single other field where a provider knew less about their customer and how their customer was consuming their product than the energy markets. So what we did is we came up with three fundamental tenets. And the first was something called continuous commissioning. And that was the idea that a third of the energy in the United States is consumed in buildings. But buildings are fundamentally generally broken. So what happens is you build a new structure, you commission the structure, you put in a building management system, and then no one ever looks at it again. And, and what happens is people come in, they override the system, sensors break, things don't work. And so you could, you, with, it's a, it's a no-brainer to save 15% of the energy in most buildings with very, very small financial investments. The second thing we, we invested in was something called demand response. And demand response is the dynamically, uh, dynamically shedding load uh, instead of firing up a peaking power plant. And it's clean, it's reliable, and it's, it's reliable enough to be dispatchable. And it's economic. It's incredibly economic because a peaking power plant is the most cost, uh, costly and, and, and least clean form of power you can, you can invest in. The third area was empowering homeowners to, to use less energy through providing information. And this model has been proven at the scale of millions of households uh, to save 10 to 15% of a home's energy just by providing comparative data month to month and, and with your, your proximal neighbors. So you put this all together, and you've got the smart grid. 
In, in our investments, our leaders in the field, we started a company called Silver Spring, which has about 80% market share of the smart grid, including PG&E in this area. Enernoc, which does demand response, started after a lecture like this. I, I, I was back at Dartmouth in 2003. I met two young men who had this idea to build an automated demand response system at a national scale. We started the company together. It's now a billion dollar public company. They have four and a half gigawatts of demand response on tap. It's equivalent to eight coal-fired power plants that don't need to be built. So you can do this, and it can matter. So I'm almost finished. And, and, and I'm going to just leave you with a couple of thoughts on my thoughts on, on, on how to be a great entrepreneur. I, I have an old friend and an Apple coworker named Guy Kawasaki. And, and he's been evangelizing this idea of, of making meaning. And, and I really think he's on to something. His point is that endeavors that are based on a higher purpose than pure economics often end up being the ones that matter. You know, if you change the world, if you improve the quality of life, if you right a wrong, you, you, you often end up with, as a byproduct with something that's very economically viable. And if you set out to so, solely to make a pile of money, it, it often ends up as a fairly hollow endeavor. So I, I think the important thing to think about this is that ventures with meaning attract passionate participants who are willing to join you on the journey. You can't afford to be incremental. Startups have no brand power, and you have no name recognition, and you have little economic clout. So you need to be bold. Listen to Kasparov. Be evo don't, be, uh, don't optimize. Be evolutionary. Uh, you can't stay on the same curve as the, the existing companies. You need to jump to the next curve, because that's a revolution. And revolution attracts outliers. And they're the catalyst for cultural shifts. At the end of the day, you want everyone to have an opinion about what you do. Love it, hate it. It probably doesn't matter all that much. But you need everyone to remember who you are. That's how you'll create rabid fans. And that's how you look larger than you are and become part of the cultural zeitgeist. Make beautiful things. Make long-lasting, intelligent things that inspire an emotional response in people. Make things people want to share. Act on the courage of your convictions, because sometimes we learn too much from experience, and it narrows the way we think about the future. So not to sound too hyperbolic, but we need to change the slope of the curve for the country. And we need to inspire the next generation to apply themselves to hard problems. And I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying it'll be speedy. But I am saying that what you all do matters a great deal to the future. So go ahead, push back on the universe. Do something amazing. And with apologies to Fort Minor, <laughs> it, it's a hard road. There are many easier ways to just make a buck. But if you're passionate about changing the world, entrepreneurship is a really wonderful path. And I, I hope this hasn't been a waste of your time. I hope that what perhaps one of you is going to find something in here that changes your way you think about this a little bit. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I will be happy to take some questions if you have any. <laughs>